Hello and welcome to part two of the Game Studios Ask Dave Anything questions. Um, we're just going to get straight back into it. <clears throat> Question number one. Hello Dave, I am a huge fan of Heroes of Might and Magic 3 especially. On which game from the series have you worked? How was it there? What did you design there? Tell us more about it, please. Thanks. So, uh, I worked on a Heroes of Might and Magic game that was canceled. This was at Ubisoft Shanghai. It originally was going to be an RTS for the consoles. I came in and started working on it, and uh, basically a dickhead from France came in and said, uh, no, this should be uh, an RPG. <laughs> and it got changed to an RPG. And then I ended up working on that for a bit before I basically told the dickhead, Serge Hasquit, that he was a dickhead and that he didn't really know what he was talking about when it came to design. And that sort of ended any <laughs> sort of career at Ubisoft Shanghai um, or most Ubisoft studios, though actually I did work at another Ubisoft studio later, which is interesting, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, so that game, the Heroes of Might and Magic game, I actually have the files. Uh, and some of the early designs and an opening cinematic uh, that had some playable elements in it uh, that I did. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll make them public because the NDAs are long gone. There's no problem with uh, talking about it now. It would have been an inter a very interesting game. Uh, it had a lot of cool systems that were going to be about your faction because there was the, the different factions of Heroes of Might and Magic, and then which faction you're working with, you sort of, you're, you would have an, this avatar that would develop in that direction. So if you were helping the demonic faction the most, your avatar would sprout flames and grow horns and things. So it would have been a very interesting game. Unfortunately, it was canceled after I had left. Um, and I don't really have any knowledge of that because I was basically let go long before that by the dickhead who has now been ousted from the industry for molesting people in elevators. Wow. Question number two. Uh, what did you do at Spicy Horse? Anything relating to Alice Madness Returns? I see it's not on the list. Nope, I had nothing to do with Alice Madness Returns. I worked on several things, but the only thing that... or There was a couple things that released, but the one that you might play, might even still be available to play, is called Akanero, which was the Little Red Riding Hood Diablo style uh, RPG. I did the core design for the game, uh, developed the um, weapon generation systems, and uh, I had developed a methodology for the storytelling. I think they ignored the storytelling and they ignored my monetization system and did something stupid. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the core gameplay is still there and sort of, sort of the way the items drop are still there, but they didn't follow my class system very well. Um, so if you're interested, I think you can still play Akinero. Um, yep, it's on Steam. It's got a 5 out of 10. So, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, they didn't... They didn't follow the designs too well. Oh, well. <clears throat> um, but Spicy Horse was a very interesting time. This was in Shanghai, China, and um, I had a good time there. Some weird times there. We'll talk about that more in depth, maybe at a later date. <clears throat> Question number three. Was there any particular reason why Orc was the only race in Warcraft 3 without access to free mana regen? Uh, humans having the aura, undead having obsidian statues, and night elves having moon wells. Orc race was also lacking in unit with complete magic immunity. Was it because Orc had unique units like Riders and Kodo with their ensnare and devour abilities? Uh, this was a conscious choice of the design team. Um, and I, I don't think I was privy to these conversations, but my understanding of it was that the orcs were supposed to be like <clears throat> not the mind, <laughs> more the brute force and, and strength. And so um, they were predominantly about uh, using their units high health and overall, you know, brute force to, to win the battles. 
And that is, I think, one of the reasons that the orcs uh, generally dominate um, these days. But yeah, with, without a, a neutral shop, like a scroll of mana or something like that, I suppose they do have a disadvantage in long-term battles. So one of the ways to defeat orc is to keep the pressure on and uh, when they're out of ma mana to, to keep pushing on them with your access to having a way to get mana. Um, but it was a conscious decision of the of the design team, as far as I recall. Um, and yeah, it was because that was sort of their unique thing, was they were big and burly and tough. And so they could fight through things and they didn't need magic. Question number four. What is your opinion on percent chance abilities like evade or critical strike? I don't think such design should be implemented in a competitive game. I had matches when striking two critical hits on an enemy in a row resulted in an instant win. Wouldn't it be more fair to have alternative approaches for such skills like Kira will do a critical once every seven hits? Yes, you are correct, but this was also a conscious decision of the design team. The idea was that Warcraft was more the randomized elements, um, which results in exactly that. There were some things in there to mitigate the randomness of it. For example, uh, we had what was called a progressive percentage. So your first chance at a critical strike, so let's say you had a 15% chance at a critical strike. Your first ch tr uh, chance at a critical strike on your first hit would be actually less than 15%. And it would gradually raise over a number of hits to get to 100%, so it was guaranteed to happen. Though you'd have to be very unlucky for it to go in that direction. But either way, it just normalized a bit more the, the randomness, so it was less random. So it's a hidden thing, but while there is random chance, it's mitigated random chance. So it's not totally out of control. And that was just a conscious choice uh, for Warcraft was to be the more random one, the more fantasy-based kind of thing, as opposed to Starcraft, which is very much, I do five damage, you take five damage every single time kind of thing, unless there's armor. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> it was a conscious choice. Uh, my opinion on it is that it worked and uh, I was perfectly fine for with it, and especially since we had that hidden mitigation for it, I think it, I think it worked out quite well and uh, kept it competitive without being overly broken. Question number five, is Activision Blizzard's top management even aware that they managed to create a game that makes people willing to abandon their life in order to play it? The Warcraft, World of Warcraft vanilla, TBC, and Wrath. Um, yeah, they're very aware of that, I would say. Uh, everyone's very aware of that. <laughs> um, I don't think that it's necessarily a good thing, but that's my personal ethics. I don't know what their ethics are. Um, I think that they would put more things in there to mitigate you wasting your life. There were certain things, like where the bonus XP, the bonus XP that you got would go away. And then it was sort of like, if you rested, you would get that bonus XP. And so then the next time you came in, you would level up faster. That was one of the things we put in there for that. Um, in China, I believe, it literally, you just stop gaining XP after a certain point. Um, so uh, we could do more to sort of encourage people to go out. Um, and in terms of how aware the top management was of that, I don't think they cared, <laughs> but maybe that's just me. Question number six. You and Jeff seem to have a lot of beef from back in the day. In current, he's been praised as the last good director. Was your conflict that of personality or design style? What lessons did you learn from working on that time at Blizzard in an interpersonal sense? So, Tiggle, Tiggle Biddies. Um, yeah, I had a few conflicts with him. This was primarily because he was an inexperienced designer in that he had absolutely no experience as a designer at all. And this was his first game and he was put in charge of quest design because he had a creative writing degree and happened to be the guild leader for Rob Pardo's EverQuest guild. So maybe that kind of, you know, <clears throat> bothered me. Um, in terms of the conflict, it was primarily that he would go behind my back and say negative things. And then when I would confront him and ask, what's up with this stuff? Why did you say this to Rob Pardo? He would deny it. And so there was no way to resolve the conflicts and um, ultimately resulted in me being ousted. Um, so 
you know, in that sense, I'm not, I don't get along well with people who are sneaky like that uh, and are what I would call um, power snakes, I think is the term I came up with for it, wherein they're seeking out power by through snake-like behaviors. Um, in terms of design style, he didn't have one. He just copied everything that he saw in EverQuest because that's all he knew. And so things like, uh, for example, our first big design fight was about um, item drops. And so my argument was that if a boar has two tusks, it should drop two tusks and you can just increase the amount of tusks you need for a quest. And his argument was that the randomness of it was f part of the fun. And uh, I just fundamentally disagreed with that um, because I thought if, if you see two tusks on the thing, it should drop two tusks. I didn't win that argument, so what can I say? Question number seven. You've brief briefly touched upon some drama with individuals during your time in Blizzard, but what about really amazing and talented colleagues you loved working with? Maybe someone that was truly outstanding in their field or just sticks out to you. There was a lot of really good people at Blizzard. So yeah, it's drama sells. So and uh, it's, it's easier to talk about, I guess, because I remember it uh, vividly. In terms of the cool people, yeah, there was a lot of really cool people. So um, Derek Simmons, who I worked with in QA and was the dungeon master for the game that I played with Sam Didier and Chris Metzen and the Templar Jason. Um, and Sarah Dwin, the goat. <laughs> um, the, they, were, they were all really cool people who I really enjoyed uh, playing Dungeons & Dragons with. Uh, or in this case, we were playing uh, Derek Simmons' homebrewed system, Avarice, which was really cool in itself uh, and had its own quirks uh, that I enjoyed. Um, but like Sam Didier and Chris Madison were really fun people to work with because they... If you came to them with ideas, like they're always like on top of it, like, yeah, let's do this, let's do that. And um, I really enjoyed working with the art department in general at, at Blizzard um, because they would, we would go back and forth with ideas. And uh, part of the reason the culling looks the way it does is because I handed over the map to the artists. And I believe it was Alan Dilling who did a pass and like sort of sit if, made it more artsy <laughs> than I could have. And, uh, you know, I really appreciated that. And that sort of back and forth was was paramount to, I think, Warcraft 3 being being what it was. And, um, yeah, Tim Campbell was great to work with and, and Matt Morris. And uh, there's a guy named Michael Heiberg who was a really awesome technical designer there. And he did a lot of the really cool, um, difficult to do things like the, the meat wagons moving perfectly in sync with each other like a train. Like that was something that he had to do because no one else, no one else could have pulled that off. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was a lot of really cool people at Blizzard, and um, uh, only, as far as I know, only Matt Morris and Sam Didier are still there at Blizzard. No, Michael Heiberg is also still there, of course. Um, and uh, Sam Didier is working on a new game, uh, some sort of survival game. Maybe that's going to be super cool. I hope it is. Question number eight. What do you think is the difference between League of Legends continuing to be a successful game in spite of being owned by Tencent, while World of Warcraft seems to still be bleeding subscribers? What are they doing that Blizzard isn't? Um, Tencent is very hands-off with uh, Riot Games, and uh, a lot of people don't understand that, um, but it's, it's true. Um, I, I know for a fact that... Uh, there's no one from Tencent like installed at the Riot Games studios dictating what they can and cannot do. Um, now, clearly, if they've like started saying bad things about the CCP, there might be some issues there. But in general, uh, Tencent doesn't do anything to tell Riot Games what they should or should not be doing. Like the Arcane series, you know, that's something that like I would say like Bobby Kotick would would put a would stop something like that from happening at Blizzard. Uh, there's no one stopping them from doing whatever they want to do, and that's why they're able to do really cool stuff. Um, now, as opposed to Activision Blizzard, where Activision literally came in and dictated uh, what they could and could not spend money on and killed Reforged effect effectively by cutting the budget to almost nothing. And, you know, that's something that just won't happen between Tencent and Riot Games. 
So that's that's what Tencent's doing, right? So what what is Riot Games doing? They're they're following their company culture and, and improving, <laughs> whereas Blizzard has sort of fallen into this morass of shit, where they can't seem to escape their own uh, failing legacy. And a lot of that is Activision's influence. How much of it is Activision's influence? I can't really say because I'm not there. Question number nine. Tell us all the dark secrets no one knows about the early development of World of Warcraft. Um, there's no real dark secrets. Um, there's, I mean, we were, I was just making quests for it uh, and I wasn't on the project that long. So it was like, from the end of the Frozen Throne to working on the quests for World of Warcraft, I think I was only there a few more months um, before the incident. So I don't know any dark secrets about World of Warcraft. I will say that it was, uh, I, I could detail the way that we worked out how we did the quests was basically we would get to a zone and we knew the level levels that we wanted the players to go up in through the zone. And we would design the quests around that. And then when you got to a certain level, this quest would breadcrumb you to the next area that you needed to be in. And it was a very organic feeling quest system that sort of drove the player from one area to the next. And I think it was very well designed. Um, beyond that, I don't have any dark secrets about that. So question 10. Uh, May the 4th is over, but what do you think of LucasArts? It's Star Wars Legends game of yore. It's non-Star Wars games like the Monkey Island series, Day of the Tentacle, Sam and Max Hit the Road in Full Throttle, and its development tenures and treatments from its glory days to its unfortunate closure, so to speak. Uh, LucasArts was a cool studio. Um, I'm... I don't have much to say about it. I only know one person who worked there. Um, and unfortunately lost his job when they closed. Um, I've, I've always been a big fan of the Sam and Max series, and um, I'm glad that that series has actually continued, so there's new Sam and Max games. I don't know. I thought it was a cool studio. I was sad when it closed. I wish they had done more. Question number 11. Uh, what do you think of Russian video game developers nowadays? With the current conflict at hand, unabashed loyalties to a now pariahed government that renders them damned in return, and also the emphasis on devs who have no choice but to accept their cutoffs from, say, Steam and GOG, and are willing enough to have their games be pirated for people who legitimately respect, if not adore, their work despite it all. Take, for example, Loop Hero. Uh, I feel bad for the Russian video game developers. I feel bad for, like, literally everybody in Russia, to be honest with you, because the people of Russia, they don't want, <laughs> no one wants war. Like almost nobody wants war. And if you ask the people on the streets, uh, unless they're being watched by the, the government, they'll probably tell you that they don't really want uh, to send their, their men and women into a war. Um, I wish that we lived in a world where people wouldn't think in such a retaliat retaliatory nature. Like what does it do to cut off Russian video game developers like and what does it do for Steam to stop selling games in Russia like how does that impact the war like who is that punishing it's not punishing the it's not even punishing the soldiers but it's certainly not punishing the Russian government who doesn't give a crap and if the idea is that oh well then the people will revolt against their government no they won't because they don't want to die so um, it just it's so stupid and petty and like we're talking about games which are entertainment that's totally non-functional in terms of having an impact on on what the people of russia are going to do um so i just think it's stupid and petty and harmful and detrimental uh to game development in general because you know russian developers have a unique take on things so i hope that this conflict will end soon and that um we can stop this stupid sanctions bullshit, which only hurts the normal people and doesn't hurt the actual people who are making the decisions and forcing people to do stupid shit, like kill other people. Question 12. Here's a question. If you had an idea to pitch to a studio for money, how would you do it? 
And to break this question apart, pitching an idea for a game, pitching an idea for a feature. And I'm sure places like Blizzard get free suggestions all the time, which they subsequently ignore. I also know that game systems can be patented too, looking at Eternal Darkness and its sanity system. So I don't pitch ideas to studios for money. You can't because um, they don't want to hear it because there's a legal liability when you do that. And so if you're sending emails to companies and uh, you think they're reading it, they're not. They delete that because there is a legal liability. So the only time to do a pitch is if you have a game you want to make and a publisher that you want to pitch it to to get the game made or for venture capital to get uh, to get it in front of venture capitalists who will fund it. So in terms of pitching a game to a studio, uh, typically it's about making some sort of demo that is somewhat playable, or at least you can show them on a computer like what it would feel like to play the game and to have a PowerPoint presentation for it. And then to have your like one minute to five minute elevator pitch where if you get someone's attention who happens to uh, be looking to invest money, you can quickly rattle off the idea and the concept and get them to ask for more information, at which point you give them, you get their phone number or email, and then you send them the, the pitch deck or do a presentation on Zoom or set up a call or whatnot. So it really is the, it's like a three-part thing. Have something you can show them, that is the gameplay. That's like the, the final step the have like a pitch deck that shows all of the concepts and core ideas of the game eight slides or less anything more than that they're bored and have the one minute elevator pitch ready in your head that you can rattle it off practice it in the mirror if you have to and uh, as concise as possible pitch your game idea in a way that's exciting to a venture capitalist and and that's something that any game developer who has gone off on their own kind of has in their back pocket is to do a, a game pitch that way. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any game that I'm pitching right now. Let me think. What was the last one? Nope, got nothing. Uh, unfortunately, my memory wipes that shit out <laughs> as soon as I. it's no longer a part of the dream. Uh, but yeah, that's the basic idea. Question 13. What are signs of a dysfunctional game studio? Is there something you can see from the outside or do you have to have inside info? Um, there's a lot of signs of a dysfunctional game studio. Um, like if you, uh, E3 was a good place to sort of see <laughs> other game studios because you got to interact with people from the game studio, developers from the studio and sort of see how they behaved. And that would tell you a lot of things. Having a Cosby suite, for example, is a sure sign that there's something dramatically wrong with the company culture of that particular game studio. But there were other tells as well. Like, um, I remember at E3 going to a booth and like the I tried to get into a conversation with the game developer about their game, and they were totally not. They didn't want to talk about it at all, basically, and they were just asking me about what I was working on. And it was very clear that they just wanted to get away from that game studio. And uh, when I delved further into it, I found that they had a very toxic work culture. And that's that's pretty common to see, I guess, in the game industry in general. Um, so yeah, it really is just like, if you talk to a dev and they just are totally down on their own studio, that's, that's there's usually a problem there. There's also the opposite where like, they're so hyped about their studio that it comes off as delusional or, or uh, a little bit crazy and uh, that's that's a sure sign that like you have to if you've ever heard the term like bleeding blizzard blue like <laughs> those are studios you want to avoid because when people are that indoctrinated it's like it ceases to be work and it becomes their life and unless you're going to make it your life too you're not going to fit in there and that's a dangerous thing you don't want your workplace to be your, your whole life uh, you need a, a, an escape from that so plenty of plenty of ways to suss out a dysfunctional game studio. Um, when, once you're inside them though, you can see a lot more and like how, just how deep the dysfunction goes. Like I've, as working as a freelancer and going to different studios to, to be uh, basically placed in-house to help with something, 
uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of dysfunction. <laughs> and uh, it, it's ranged from everything from just like a alcoholic work culture to uh, things like, uh, like a project or, no, he was like a studio product owner so he owned all the products of the studio and he was dictating design and like doing things and demoralizing all the designers and that was like a nightmare for everyone uh, who worked there so there we go i've answered all the questions about game studios i finished the ones about the game industry the next set of questions will be about the games that i've worked on so if you have any of if you've not seen the list of games that i've worked on uh I'll, we'll put that up again and uh, feel free to get any extra questions about that in. I've already got 20 questions for it, but the way that I'm doing this now is I'm trying to answer as many as I can before my throat gives out, which it is doing as we speak. <clears throat> so uh, thanks for joining me and uh, remember to ask those questions. Join me on Discord, like and subscribe, all the good stuff, and I'll talk to you later.